Good morning, BT Church Online. Welcome to the weekend. So excited that you made the decision to join us today for Church Online. My name is Danny and I am your online pastor. And I would love to give you some ways that you can connect with us right now. If you guys are watching on Facebook, head over to our Facebook uh, chat, our comment section where you can go and engage with other people who are also tuning in to Church Online right now, where you can go drop by, drop a comment, say good morning to somebody. Let us know where you're watching from, your city or your state. I know the reality is that it is summertime, so maybe some of you guys are out on vacation, but you're tuning in to Church Online right now. Let us know where you are, and our online chat host is ready to engage and chat with you right now. We also have availability to chat on YouTube and the BT Church app, and so multiple ways that you guys can connect with us right here and right now, and we are excited for today. I'm believing that the fact that you are here right now is is that you're believing that God is going to speak to you today. And so we are expecting and anticipating God to show up in each and every one of our lives in big ways. And you came on a great Sunday because today we are starting a brand new sermon series called Rise Up. And this is a sermon series where for the next eight weeks, we're going to be walking through the book of Nehemiah. And if you've never read Nehemiah, maybe you never even heard that Bible name, you don't know anything about the story, this is a powerful story. And the whole focus of this series is about challenging each other to rise up in our faith. As we're going to look at today in Nehemiah chapter 1, I want to give us a quick preview is that Nehemiah hears about the condition of his city and it causes him to bow down before God in prayer. And so this is going to be a powerful sermon series of really just looking at what are the proper steps of rebuilding our city, both physically, spiritually, and showing people who Jesus is and calling believers to believe God for big things, to rise up in our faith as we see Nehemiah display uh, throughout his story. So it's going to be a remarkable time. Uh, let me pause and say this. We concluded our series Next Is Now last Sunday. And maybe for some of you, you missed last week's message. Maybe you missed the whole series and you're just joining us for the first time. Uh, you can go to our YouTube page and go back and watch any of our previous messages. And I want to encourage you to do that because I believe that God's going to use those messages to encourage and challenge you in your faith. And so if you go to youtube.com slash BT Church, you can go and check out uh, some awesome sermons on there. But there's also other resources that we put on our YouTube page that will encourage you in your faith, whether it's a community group video, a podcast, all that is posted on there. And when you subscribe, you're notified whenever a brand new video is dropped. So be sure to hit up that resource for you. Uh, but today it's going to be exciting because we have our Sherry Line campus pastor, Pastor Juan, is going to be bringing the word today, and it's going to be awesome. And I'm believing that God's going to use Pastor Juan to speak to each and every one of us. And we're also continuing to pray for Pastor Juan. A couple of weeks ago, we posted a video, and we announced that Pastor Juan has felt the call to lead he and his family out to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And so his time at BT is coming to an end. They're leaving at the end of this month. And so we are excited for Pastor Juan, but also we're sad to see him leave as God has used him in big ways by starting our first campus, our Sherryland campus outside of McAllen. Uh, and, and God has been remarkable in his life. And so we are praying for him uh, and we are excited about to see what God does through him and his family out in the Dallas Fort Worth area. So if you know Pastor Juan, shoot him a message, let him know that you are praying for him. But he is bringing the word today. And so right now you can grab your Bible, open up to Nehemiah and get ready for God to speak to you in powerful ways. And so speaking of Nehemiah, well, one thing we're going to do and we're challenging each other is throughout this series, we are doing a Nehemiah reading challenge. And I would love to encourage you to jump on this reading challenge. If you've never read it or if you've read it before, it doesn't matter. Uh, we would love to have you in our, in our challenge. And the way this is going to work is this. Is over the next about two or three weeks, we're going to spend time breaking down the book of Nehemiah and just reading the entire thing. It's not a long book, about 13 chapters long. So some days it's going to be a full chapter. Some days it's maybe half a chapter or a short passage. And what's going to happen is that day you're going to read the passage. And then in our Nehemiah reading challenge group chat, we're going to talk about the passage where you just maybe drop a comment drop a question of something that God is teaching you or challenging you with, and you can even drop prayer requests as well. So right now, if you grab your phone and text the phrase BT online to 97,000, you can jump into our Nehemiah reading challenge that's going to happen over the next couple of weeks. And so the challenge is going to take place on the BT Church app. 
Maybe you know this, maybe you didn't know this already, but you can create a profile on the app, put your picture on there, throw your name and information, and you can also jump into our group chat. So on the homepage of the BT Church app, there's a little messaging icon. Click on that icon. You can hit the, the tab Discover, and you can find different group chats that you can jump into. Look for the Nehemiah Reading Challenge and jump into the challenge. It's going to start on Monday as we're going to start off with Nehemiah Chapter 1, and we'll be posting some stuff on there. So jump on the Reading Challenge and read Nehemiah with us uh, as we engage into this new sermon series. And what I love about the start of a new sermon series is that this is a great time to start a community group. And so maybe for you, you've been uh, hearing that announcement for quite some time, and maybe you've been feeling God stirring it in your hearts and minds to lead out in this way. We would love to encourage you to do this because the way our community group works is you watch the weekend sermon series, you watch the weekend sermon, and then you engage in community and talk about it together. And so the start of a new sermon series is a great time to consider and pray about starting a new community group. And you can do this either in person or online. You can open up your home, invite people into your home, you can meet at a coffee shop, however you want to do it, or if you want to do it online, you could do it on Zoom, on Google Meet, whatever digital platform that you choose, and you can lead out in community. So what I love about uh, the online option is that no matter where you are located, you can experience community with us. And so if anybody wants to start a community group, just text BT online to 97000 right now, and you'll be given some steps on how to make it happen. It can be any day of the week. It can be any time of the week, morning, lunch, evening. It doesn't matter whatever time works best for you and we would love to see more community groups started now that we are starting a brand new sermon series so pray about it and I'm, I'm excited to see what God does with that and so as we get ready for uh, just for today's uh, uh, sermon to start for today's uh, service to start we are anticipating that God's going to do big things and so right now what I want you to do is invite somebody to church. Hit that share button on Facebook. Text a friend the YouTube link. Let them know that church is about to start. And so we are gearing up. Our worship team is getting ready. Pastor Juan is getting ready. And he's excited about today. Uh, and it's going to be a remarkable time. And right now, what I want to do really quick before we pray is just welcome any new people who are joining us today for the first time. We believe that you're our VIP, and so thank you so much for making the decision to join us today. Just do me a favor and text the phrase BTVIP to 97000 so we can reach out to you and pray with you and get to know you just a little bit. Let's pray as we get ready for this service to start. Father God, we love you. Thank you for the ways that you're moving our lives, God. Right now, I pray that you would remove distractions and help us focus this time in on you and teach us about yourself today, challenge us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church Online, we love you guys, and we'll see you guys right after the service. Good morning, church. Why don't we stand up for worship? God is good? And all the time? Amen, church. Man, I'm so excited to be in the house of the Lord today. Church, we want to invite you guys. If you want to come to the altar, come. Man, I choose this day to be grateful to the Lord because He is good to me. Amen? Let's sing. I choose this day to be grateful, Lord. I give you praise with an open heart. I'm waking up to heaven. And I'm waking up to you. I'm waking up to you. I'm waking up to heaven. Oh, I'm waking up. I'm waking up to you. Choose this day. I choose this day to be grateful. To be grateful. Lord. Come on, sing with us. I give you praise with an open heart. Waking up to the day. Oh, I'm waking up. I'm waking up.
For always being good. Come on, sing. For always being good. Thank you for all your mercies that are new. Thank you in spirit and in truth. Thank you. I'm telling you. Thank you. People, let's come on. Your faithfulness, like the sunrise, your endless love reaches past the skies, waking up to heaven, waking up, waking up to you, oh, waking up to you.
Amen. Let's give a praise. Thank you, God. Amen. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Oh, heaven, come down. Just one touch, my heart is open to see.
make God come on and sing I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet thank you Jesus you are building our faith this morning God to trust you to believe Lord God we lean back on you Lord God and we rest in you walking around these walls I thought by now they fall but you have never failed me yet oh no 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 waiting for change to come knowing the battles won for you have never promise still says great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet. I'm trusting you Lord
your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithful you're the kind of god that's faithful yes i'm still in your hands this is my and his goodness toward us hallelujah we rest lord god in the knowledge that you are have good plans for your kids lord god that you have good in store for us god that your faithfulness is coming after us jesus i love you lord oh your mercy never fails me all my days i've been held in your hand moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God come on let's lift our voice all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so that I am able Oh, I will see of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other On you as a father known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so goodness of God is I'm going to see Lord come on listen to voice your goodness is running after it's running after me you can sing it out
Amen. Good morning, BT. My name is Louie. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at BT Church. I'm just so excited to welcome you this morning as we worship um, our King and our Lord, King Jesus. Amen. Um, the video you just saw, you just laid eyes on what is our Kingsville campus. Amen. Uh, it is official, and um, uh, we are excited about being in Kingsville, and uh, God is starting to orchestrate and move and uh, in a lot of different ways, and uh, I'm just going to ask you to please keep um, our Kingsville campus now in your prayers as we get ready to make that official and, uh, and, and are, are doing all the things that need to take place for us to, to begin to do some ministry in that community. We're excited about the fact that God has opened doors there. We're excited about the fact that we can walk through those doors when God says to do so. Amen. And uh, because of that, uh, praise God, we can now say that we have three campuses in the Rio Grande Valley, and we have three campuses in the Coastal Bend. With Alice, uh, you know that we're meeting now twice a month in Corpus and getting Corpus going, and now we will be in Kingsville also, and so we're grateful for that. Please continue to pray for God to move. We have a vision here at BT Church to love and to reach South Texas, and God is allowing us to live out that vision. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, again, I want to welcome you this morning. Church, would you help me in welcoming our online family, our online church? We're so grateful that you're watching today. Thank you for being with us. And uh, uh, again, we pray that you will be blessed as you're watching online. And whether you're watching online or whether you're here physically and you're here for one of the first times ever, we want to welcome you. We want to tell you that you are our VIP. Um, and we want to ask you to text the word BTVIP to the number 97,000. Uh, when you do, you'll get some prompts. Follow those prompts. And it's going to give us an ability to get to know you better, to be able to connect with you, and to be able to serve you. And that's what we want to do here. So please know that, that uh, we look forward to getting to know you. And uh, we pray that you will make a connection. So text that word, BTVIP, to the number 97,000. All right. Uh, again, just so excited about so many things that are taking place, so many things that God is doing here at BT Church, especially as the summer is just getting going, right? And uh, so many activities that are taking place. We just celebrated our junior kids camp this week and had a great time with our little, little ones. Amen. And uh, that being said, I want to make you aware, parents and families, that we have our kids camp coming up at the end of this month. It starts on June 29th. Please make sure that you... Uh, uh, sign up your kids. This is for kids in grades third through sixth grade. Third through sixth grade. If you have a third grader through sixth grader, you want them to be a part of kids camp. That'll be June 29th. You can go to our website, bt.church backslash events, and you can register there. You can sign up. It'll be a great week for our kids. Um, that being said, with the different camps that we got going on, our students are leaving to Camp Zephyr tomorrow. Can we get excited about that? Amen. All right, and so uh, uh, every mom and dad said hallelujah and amen, and, uh, and uh, so we're excited for our students going to Zephyr. We know God has great things in store for them, and uh, we pray that it's going to be an amazing week where they can really connect with God uh, and, and learn about some things that God wants for their life. So be in prayer for our student ministry, for Pastor Colin, for our student team as they head to Camp Zephyr tomorrow. I believe uh, they'll, they'll, they're going to be here, uh, show up tomorrow at, I think they got to meet here at noon um, and we'll head out tomorrow so um, they, they've got their instructions and everything so be in prayer for them a lot of great things that are taking place want to make you aware also this summer that we have our next first steps class that will be starting on June 22nd what is first steps that is our membership class that is how you become a member of the BT church family so maybe you've been here for a while and you've been thinking about it you've been at one of our different campuses if you're watching online maybe you've been thinking about it well, I want to encourage you to sign up for First Steps. That is our four-week membership class, and uh, it'll be a great time. Child care is provided for every session. A meal is provided at every session. You can go to our website at bt.church, and you can sign up for our First Steps class. Uh, it'll be a, an exciting time, and we look forward to you all connecting here at BT Church and making BT Church your home. Amen? So many great things that are going on. Make sure you're aware of everything that is taking place here at BT Church. Today we are kicking off a brand new series called Rise Up. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. And the reason I say that is because there's nothing like the start of a brand new series to get joined 
and connect it to a community group. We have CGs across all our campuses. What are community groups? They're smaller groups of folks from 8 to 10 to 12 to 15 folks that meet in local homes and do life together, have fellowship, enjoy meals, and do a Bible study together, usually that's based off of the sermon. And that's why I'm saying that it's, there's no better time to join a community group than when we're kicking off a brand new series like we're doing today. Um, if you want some more information there, you can visit our info center. You can get on our website at bt.church. Get connected to a community group. It will be a blessing to your life. I promise you, those of you all that are involved in our community groups can give an amen to that, right? Uh, it's an absolute blessing in your life, and so I pray that you'll get involved with that. Well, church, we've come to the time that we're going to continue to worship our God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Can we get excited about that, church? Here at BT, we get excited about that because it's an opportunity for us to show our gratitude to our God. It's an opportunity for us to say thank you and to worship our God by bringing to Him what is His, His tithe, and by giving in our offerings above our tithe. The tithe is not something that we give. The tithe is something that we bring because it doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. Amen? That's His. And so we bring it to His storehouse. We bring it to our place of worship, and we give it to Him. Anything we give above our tithes, that is something we seek God about, and that's called an offering. That's something that we give above what is already God's. It's our privilege to do so at this time. I'm going to ask if you'll bow your heads with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask him to bless our time of giving. Our God and our Father, we come to you this morning, and we thank you for being so good to us. We're grateful that at this point in our worship of you, we can express our gratitude and we can express our love for how you provide for us and how you give us everything that we have. It is our privilege to give back to you, Lord. It is our privilege to say thank you in this way and to be obedient and faithful. May you bless the giving of our tithes and our offerings. May you bless your people as they give. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus and all of your church said. Amen, church. As you prepare our offerings, let's also remember to prepare our hearts in reverence of the God who overcame the cross, death, the grave, and most importantly, the sins of those who he chose, those who he loves and has called. So let's sing this out. You're the God who came. You're love made. From existence now alive again You're the God who came Cause He gave it all You gave it all For this helpless soul He expected nothing Yet expecting nothing in return You gave
never forget, Lord, that you overcame no faults, no troubles, no heartache, Lord, that we endure can ever amount to the sacrifice that you paid on that cross. And Father God, as we repair our hearts to listen to this message, may we continue to remember that sacrifice and all you've done for us and continue to do for us. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Well, how you doing? How you been? Good morning, church, family. So good to be back. So good to see you. And thank you so much for joining us at BT Church. And so whether if you're online or offline, BT is one church in multiple locations where mi casa, su casa. This is home. Amen? Amen. We truly believe here at BT that you can call this place home. And we absolutely also believe that God is doing some amazing big things here in this place. And so, by the way, my name is Juan, and I've had the honor and privilege of being the campus pastor for a Sherryland location for the last five and a half years. And uh, God is doing some amazing things. God is absolutely doing some amazing things. And as many of you know, uh, my family and I, uh, we are packed and ready to leave at the end of this month, and we're headed to Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and so that's Noah, Leanna, Ethan, Lily, and myself. And what really warm, warms my heart is that we get to go and do life, to experience life together as a family. And so with that said, this morning, I'd like to um, take some time to thank some special people. First off, I'd like to thank all the elders of the church here at BT uh, for the opportunity and the responsibility of uh, allowing me to shepherd the people at our Sharing Land campus. And so guys, I'm not going to lie. Day one, I had no idea what in the world I was doing, right? But praise God that, that he does and that he was leading the way. Um, and so five and a half years here um, at our Sherryland campus and then two years here at the McAllen campus as the middle school youth pastor uh, for uh, some of the students here that I've seen that are probably like 20 times taller than I am uh, right now. Um, and secondly, I'd also like to thank all of our pastoral staff. I'd like to thank all of our team leads and every single person who makes up who is part of an elite team here at uh, that serve at the on our BT staff. They are elite, and uh, they make all of this happen on any given Sunday. And so, to them, I want to wholeheartedly thank you for allowing me, giving me the opportunity to partner with you in the gospel. It has truly been a great run, and. Um, what's amazing is that we both got to see God do some amazing, amazing things. And so we know that for BT, the best is yet to come. As we continue to believe that God would continue to do above and beyond all that we can ask or think. And to him and to him alone be the glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so this morning, I have the honor and privilege of kicking off a brand new series in the book of Nehemiah. And so once again, we're kicking it old school. We're kicking it all the way back into the Old Testament. And so if you have your Bible or smart device, follow me to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to be reading through the entirety of the chapter. And just for reference, Nehemiah is nicely tucked between Ezra and Esther. Nehemiah chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and this is the word of God. The word of Nehemiah, son of Hakilah, during the months of Chislev in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, 
Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah and questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. They said to me, the remnant in the providence who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of the heavens. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and all-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. Let your eyes be open to your ears. Be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we've committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. I have accepted. I've acted corruptly towards you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you have gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, and even though your exiles are banished to the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose my name, have my name dwell. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. At the time, I was the king's cup bearer. Let's pray. Lord, our Lord, we praise you. And we thank you. How magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have filled the heavens with your majesty. And today I will speak of your splendor, your glorious majesty and of your wondrous works. All that we say and do today, I pray that it bring honor and glory to your name that we can make much of who Jesus is. And so I pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened so that we may know the hope of your calling. And what is the wealth of the glorious inheritance of the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of your power towards us who believe all according to the mighty working of your strength? For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. And so church, I am super confident that over the last seven weeks that across multiple locations, across all of our campuses, that we had an amazing, a great time in our sermon series, Next Is Now. I am equally confident that for the next seven weeks, as we hit up, as we hit up Nehemiah, that you all will equally be blessed. And so, speaking of Nehemiah, both Jewish and Christian tradition Both agree, both recognize Ezra as the author. And further evidence points to the fact that at one time, both uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. But what we know for certain and what we can say with great confidence this morning is that the book of Nehemiah is Israel's recorded history, is the history of Israel's return from the Babylonian captivity all the way to the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And so get this, for the next seven weeks, over the course of the next seven weeks, we are going to be talking about how faith can rise up in a person to spark transformation and renewal. We're talking about contagious faith, outrageous faith, faith, as we say today, faith that would make much of who Jesus is. And so when we talk about that, we're talking about faith that impacts our personal space, faith that impacts our public space, our friends, our family, our finances, our careers, our future, our dreams, our aspirations, the very fabric of our existence. 
And so church, where do we find Nehemiah? At the very beginning of the chapter, we find Nehemiah from the get-go, straight from the text, right off the bat, he is broken. And his people, his people are far from God. They are desperate and they're seeking God's blessing. His people are in great trouble and disgrace. And listen, to add injury to insult, Jerusalem, the place he and his people call home is in utter ruins. Think about this. How many people right now, today, do you know of whose lives are in utter ruins? How many people do you know today, right now, this morning, whose lives are in great trouble because they are far from Jesus? Church, this, the next seven weeks, we are talking about contagious faith, outrageous faith, obedient faith. Faith that impacts not only our personal space, but our public space. And so this faith, faith that would make much of who Jesus is. Faith that would make much of who Jesus is should spark transformation and renewal. And the following eight verses, starting with verse 3, all the way down to the end of the chapter, we see... Nehemiah's first response. And this is going to be key. This is going to be the theme for today. Nehemiah's first response. Now, keep that in mind because I'm going to switch gears for just a bit. But I need you to remember to keep in mind Nehemiah's first response. Now, I don't know about you, but my brain probably works a little bit different. But when I think of a first response, I automatically think of a first responder. And so if we have any first responders in the house, I wanna salute you for the job that you do day in and day out to serve our community. So thank you so much for serving, absolutely. And so by definition, a first responder is a person with specialized training who is among the first to arrive and provide assistance at the scene of an emergency. In other words, they are highly trained to assess any situation to help save lives. Now, on the flip side, as a first responder in Christ, we too have a specialized training because of the relationship that we have with God through Christ. And this specialized training, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and because of the power of God's word, we too, we too can assess or rather discern any situation. And because of these two realities, because of these two realities of the Holy Spirit and God's word, we are able to respond. Our first response, much like Nehemiah, is that we should always, always respond with prayer first. That should be our first response. Now, church, if we are to look at the Big C Church, the Big C Church as a spiritual hospital, filled with people that are lost, imperfect, and wounded. Then in Christ, again, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit and by God's word to assess or discern any situation, get this, to help save lives, or rather, point them to the one who is able to save. Amen? Amen. So as a first responder in Christ, we are to inspire transformation and renewal. And if, if, just if, if I'm on the right track this morning, then our first response, prayer should always be the first response. And so if you're taking notes this morning, church, prayer is our first response because in prayer we worship we worship. Listen to what Nehemiah says back in verse five. He says, I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. And so we need to acknowledge what is happening in the text. 
Nehemiah, even though he is broken, even though he is filled with tremendous, tremendous burden, he starts off his prayer, not with a request, but with worship. But didn't I just mention that Nehemiah was broken and filled with tremendous, tremendous burden? I'm not sure what you're going through this morning. I'm not sure what you're experiencing this morning. I'm not sure if you feel broken this morning. I'm not sure if you have or are dealing with tremendous, tremendous burden. But with that said, I truly believe that Nehemiah had an excuse had a big excuse to start off his prayer with a big ask. He had an excuse to start off his prayer with a need, with a petition, with a desire, and simply just to say, I need something, God. And yet we see the complete opposite. We see Nehemiah respond with worship. And how often, church, how often should you be doing this? How often should I be doing this? How often should we be doing this? And the answer is all the time, all the time. We should respond to God, not with our circumstances, not with a request, but just exactly what Nehemiah did. He's broken He's filled with burden upon burdens upon his people. His homeland is in ruins. And he begins worshiping the God of the universe. He says, not just the God of the heavens, but the, the great and awe-inspiring God, a God of awesomeness, a God who is a promise maker and a God who is a promise keeper and who loves those who keeps his commands. When we pray to the Father, we should always be left in all. There's some lessons that both you and I, this morning, we can absolutely learn from Nehemiah, his circumstances, where he felt, where he was lost, incomplete, and yet he prays. He prays to the Father, and just listening and reading and studying his prayer leaves me in awe. Because I should, we should be responding to the God of the universe exactly how Nehemiah responds. A life of worship is knowing how great God is, even when your life might not be so great right now. Let me read that again. A life of worship is knowing how great God is, even when your life might not be so great right now. I'm not sure what circumstances you're facing right now. And saying that statement is easier said than done. But let me rest assure you, church, that nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in the Bible does God ever say that life is ever going to be easy. And I might even be preaching to the choir right now. But when we sign up, when we come to Christ, it doesn't mean that our life is going to be perfect, but rather but rather that we can acknowledge God for who he is no matter what in the world is going on in our lives. Our worship should not de be dependent on our circumstances, and this is exactly what we see from Nehemiah. Worship helps to connect us to the right person. Worship helps to connect us to the right perspective, and worship helps us to surrender to God's awesomeness. There's no more or less. This is a fact. As we read through the text, as we see Nehemiah hard-pressed for himself and for his people, for the things, for God's name, for his renown and his renown alone. Listen to what Psalms 8 verses 3 through 9 say. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, O oh Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. And as we pray, as we worship God through prayer, we must be reminded that no one supersedes him. Just think about that. As you sit wherever you're at and you spend time, quality time with God, and you pray to the Father in heaven, 
realize that nobody supersedes him. Nobody is above him. No one can do a perfect job such as him. No one can match him and nobody certainly is on his level. He never calls in sick. He never takes a vacation and he never runs late. Think about that. Think about how amazing God is, how awe-inspiring God is towards us, how faithful he is towards us, even when we are unfaithful towards him. And as we see the world and culture change around us, drifting further and further from God, we have to be a people like Nehemiah who are broken and burdened for the people around us. We must rise up. Our faith must not only impact our personal space, but it must also impact our public space. We must have that contagious faith, that outrageous faith, obedient faith that sparks transformation and renewal. We need to start thinking about the people around us who are in dire need of a savior. This is the same faith that Nehemiah had right here in chapter one. And listen, as he continues to pray and worship, later on in the text, we see Nehemiah pray for restoration, for repentance. He is praying on behalf of people around him. We should be doing the same for our family members, our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, people who are far from Christ, our nation, the world. We should be praying for people around us that God would give us an opportunity. Like we should be ready. You give me time, place, purpose, and a person. And I'll put it on my calendar and I will be ready to share the gospel. Ready to point somebody to the all-inspiring God. Prayer is our first response because there is a reward. So we've gone from worship. Now we understand that prayer is our first response because there is a reward. Now, there's nothing wrong with rewards. Let's just get that out of the way, okay? There's nothing absolutely wrong when we view God and we seek God and we ask God and we worship God and as we pray to God that God would wholeheartedly reward us. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, we're not talking about Bentleys or private jets, right? And we're certainly not talking about the prosperity gospel either. But again, let me reiterate, there is absolutely nothing wrong with expecting God to reward us. Think about this. When we come to Christ, right? When we fully surrender our lives to Christ, we come to Christ Uh, Through Christ, he reconciles, right? The reward is he reconciles our relationship back with God. He fixes our relationship with God. That in itself is a reward. He restores us back to right standing with the Father. And when we come to Christ, the reward is this. Jesus deposits or imputes his righteousness into our accounts. And because of that, through Christ and because of Christ, we now have a place, a spot for eternity. What an eternal reward. And I can go on and on and on about rewards. And so there is absolutely nothing wrong when we expect God to reward us if we wholeheartedly seek him and seek his will. And in the text, notice how Nehemiah truly understands that the rewards of God are directly connected to the promises of God. And this is where we need to handle God's word correctly so that we can correctly experience the rewards of God. And we have to be careful here, right? We have to be careful here. You've heard this time and time again. We cannot love the gift more than the giver. We can't. Our love is to supersede, right? Supersede any gifts. And our love is wholeheartedly for the giver. We seek the giver because he is our great 
provider. Listen to what Hebrews 11.6 says. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. There's the formula, right? We are rewarded because we seek him and we should seek him wholeheartedly and we should seek him for his will and not our will. We should seek him for things that we need wholeheartedly and things that he would allow us to have. And so with that said, nothing in the text, right? Nothing in the text in Nehemiah and nothing in the text in Hebrews points to yachts, private jets, or Bentleys. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things. Absolutely nothing wrong with any of those things. But when they replace God, then all of a sudden you have a God-sized problem and you don't want to have a god size problem. We can never love the gift more than the giver. And so that prayer, we have to understand that prayer deepens our relationship with God and it should consist of time. It should consist of time. I said this in the first service. I don't exactly remember. It's been a while, but I remember reading and the author says this, that your kids that kids, children, my kids will spill love, T-I-M-E. That's how my kids spell love. That if I say that I love them and don't spend time with them, then those are just words. But if I tell them that I love them and then I devote time to them, then I am not only just expressing my love for them, I am proving my love for them. And so our relationship with God needs to consist of T-I-M-E. If we say that we love God, then we need to show him by giving him our T-I-M-E. And it should also consist of communication and intimacy. Nehemiah understood this truth because he was rewarded with God's attention. Let us be careful that we don't pray for the wrong rewards. And lastly, Prayer is our first response because we desire results. We desire results, right? Let's not hide behind the bush, beat around the bush about it. But when we pray, we're asking God for results. Case in point, as I mentioned earlier, as most of you know already, we're headed to, uh, to Fort Worth. And so there's a lot of moving pieces since both Lily and I, we, we, we prayed about it. We saturated this decision in prayer. We talked to our kids. And then from there, we talked to leadership. And then from leadership, we talked to the staff. And from staff, we led our, our dream team people at our Sherryland campus know. And so there's been a lot of pieces, a lot of moving pieces that I don't have enough time to, to share this morning. But fast forward, last Monday, um, or last Friday, we, we closed on our house, right? Finally, somebody bought our house and all the paperwork and everybody who has to touch the, the files of the selling of our house, we finally sell it. Then on Sunday night, Lily and I, we got some, some houses that, that we have saved on Zillow and we we're like, man, if this house um, makes it to next weekend, it, it might not be our house. We reach out to our realtor and we say, hey, listen, um, we want to put a bid on our house, right? So as we're doing that, that Sunday, that day before, which is Sunday morning, I preached the sermon at our Sharon Land campus. And for probably the last six months, after I preach at our campus, time of response, you're going to see me down there, you know, asking people to pray for me. We have an amazing, an amazing dream team at our Sharonland campus. And we have our, our directors of altar ministry, Marisol and Jimmy Bruce. Jimmy is my boy. So when I need to respond, I'm hitting him up, right? And I said, Jimmy, we just closed in our house, right, on, on Friday. I said, now the hard work begins because now we need... We need a house up in Fort Worth, and the market is insane. It's insane here. It's insane over there. And you have to bid maybe fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, maybe even thirty thousand dollars over this price. So, Lily and I, we had projections. I had a list. We had links. We were praying. I said, Jimmy, we need a house, man. 
Can you just pray? I just want to come to the Lord and thank him wholeheartedly. I want to come with a heart of thanksgiving and thank the Lord that he did the impossible. He sold our house within a month. Now we need him to continue to do the impossible because we need a house because we are set off to leave to Fort Worth at the end of this month. I know, Jimmy, a lot of moving pieces. I'm asking a lot, but can you just pray? He prays a blessing over me, and I kid you not, 24 hours later, we, we do a, a virtual walkthrough of the house that we want. There's no bids for that house. Amazingly, there's no bids for that house. It's in a great area, great school district. It's a great house. We told the realtor, let's pull the trigger. And in my head, I'm willing, okay, we're projected 15, 20 over, right? She says, hey, let's, let's put the bid in at list price. I'm like, what? I'm already saving money. Let's go. She says, okay, wait, let's be a little bit aggressive. She says, let's bid just 5,000 over. I'm, I'm like, I'm still saving money with you, girl. Let's go. Let's do this. So we put in the bid. I come back to church. We're in summer prep. We're prepping for this sermon. And then my wife calls me mid-sermon prep, and she says, babe, we got the house. I'm like, what in the world? Results, right? Here's what I don't want you to read between the lines, that God will answer your prayer within 24 hours. Listen, church, we had been saturating, saturating. We've been asking family and friends and leadership to be praying for us that God would orchestrate every single step, even from the realtor who helped us sell our house here right down the street. And so when we pray, I mean, we can't lie about it. We want to see results. And the reason why we want to see results is because we pray to an able God. We pray to a God who is able to do above and beyond all that we can ask or even think. And so this blows my mind. We close on our house on the 27th. We're loading everything up in our moving truck on the 28th. And we're on the road on the 29th. Exactly. <laughs> exactly what we had asked God to do in our lives. Results. So far, again, we've gone from worship, rewards, and now to results. Remember what we find Nehemiah in verse 4. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of the heavens. So much. Listen, we can spend hours and hours cutting up the text this morning. But even just that text, the heart, the consistency, the brokenness, the burden that we see in Nehemiah's life, he's broken, he's weeping, he's, he's fasting, he's praying for his people and the people around him. He's praying for the brokenness around him and he wholeheartedly wants to make much of who God is. We have so much to learn. Listen, after today, we'll be done with chapter one and then we're off to, to the next chapter for the next seven weeks. But there is so much to continue to learn just simply from Nehemiah's first response should always, our first response should always start with prayer. We find him broken, distraught, discouraged, and hopeless for the situation he and his people are in. And we know that Nehemiah's desire, his pray, is to see results. We see him ask God, give your servant success today. He's asking for grace and for favor. How many of us, how many times have we prayed over and over at the beginning of the day, Lord, give me a great day. We're asking for success. We're asking for favor. We're asking for his grace. We're asking for his peace that every step that we take, that we would make much of who he is. And this is exactly what we see Nehemiah doing in 
the text. And we can only conclude that Nehemiah is able to pray this prayer because he believes that God is an active God. He is an ever-present God. He is a sovereign God, a God who can move people, places, and things for his honor and for his glory, for his renown and for his renown alone. There's no bragging rights for us, church. There's no way that I can say, oh man, we got the best realtor and we somehow made it happen. There's no bragging rights for me. There's no bragging rights for me for eternity. I couldn't even save myself. And so church, when we ask God for results and we have answered prayer, I believe, I believe this with all my heart, that as he answers prayer, that should instill in us in awe in, in, in who God is. Because then in turn, we turn around and we give him the glory and the glory alone. When God answers our prayers, when I see God moving people, places, and things in real time, in real life, right now, he ceases to amaze me. And I thought... October of 1993, when he saved me, I thought that that was just the amazing thing that God could ever do. And every time he ceases to amaze me, he continues to leave me in awe. He should continue to leave us day in and day out. You woke up this morning alive. You should be in awe of that. You have a roof over your head. You should be in awe of that. You have money in the bank right now. You should also be in awe of that. And if you're in Christ this morning, you should wholeheartedly, for eternity, be in awe of the goodness and the greatness of who God is. And that should leave you in awe. It doesn't mean that circumstances are perfect right now because we said that our circumstances shouldn't be dependent. Our worship shouldn't be dependent on what is going on in our lives. Nobody's life is perfect. But what we do know is this. The one who is with us is absolutely 100% perfect. And he fights for us and he's with us, and he never leaves us stranded. He never leaves us high and dry. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so at the very beginning of verse 11, listen to what Nehemiah says. He says, please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. I love to ask God to bow down his ear to listen to my petitions. It's not like he cannot hear my prayers because he can absolutely hear my prayers even if I just think them. He knows them already. Even before I request them, he already knows ahead of time what I need. But I love to show him respect and renown. Oh, dear Lord, bow down your ear. Would you just a lot time to listen to my requests? And this is what Nehemiah does. And he says wholeheartedly at the end of the day, all I want to do is that your name would be renowned, made famous, that we could make much of who you are. Church, for the next seven weeks, we're going to be talking about contagious faith, outrageous faith, obedient faith that sparks us that sparks transformation and renewal not only in our personal space but in our public space who can you think of today this morning today this afternoon who can you think of right now one person who you know their life right now is in utter ruin that one person right now whose life is in great danger because they are far from Jesus. How can God use you? Are you prepared right now as you leave this place, this place that we call church, and you know that this is just the building, both you and I in Christ, we are the church. They need to see us, the church, give him his honor and his glory. They need to see and have this contagious faith so that we can point them to the one as a first responder in Christ, to point them to the one who is able to save. 
for the next steps that Nehemiah is about to encounter in the next chapters will need a God-sized response. Are the results you are looking for needing a God-sized response this morning? Are the results you're asking for, will they bring honor and glory to his name? And so the question this morning is, what are the next steps that both you and I, we need to take? How are we to respond to God's word? And I'm a firm believer that if we listen, if we hear God's word, there must, there needs to be a response. And thank God at BT, after we preach, there's always a response time for you to understand who you are in comparison to God and how much you need him and how dire you are in need of his goodness and his greatness and that he knows your burdens, he knows your brokenness, he knows your needs even before you request him and that because of Christ that we now have access to the Father where we can respond him, respond to him, not with a request, but with worship, wholehearted worship. And so this morning, if you're here this morning and you are far from Christ, you've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let me just tell you this. I made that decision back in October of 1993, and my life has never been the same again. But in 1993, I had to understand and recognize that I was a sinner, that I had broken God's commands that I was imperfect, that I had been born into sin, and that even if I thought at that time that maybe I probably only maybe broke one out of the 10, that in my mind, that was a passing grade. That's a 90% out of 100, right? That's a passing grade, and yet with God, he desires 100%, perfection. And both you and I, we could never, ever come to perfection And so in 1993, October of 1993, I understood that I was a sinner. And let me just say this. I was, Paul says that that he is the sinner of all sinners. I think that I could give him some competition on that. But I knew that I was a sinner and that I was in dire need of a savior. And this is what I understood from the evangelist that day who preached the gospel to me five days in a row. And the last day I understood that my sin, that we all sin, and that my sin has separated me from a relationship with God. And I understood that God so loved me, God so loved the world, that he sent his only begotten son. He sent the remedy of sin through Christ. And Jesus was born both fully God and fully man and walked this earth, was tempted, but did not sin. And he died a brutal death. The Bible tells us that he was beaten to a pulp, that he was unrecognizable, that he did not look human. And yet he went to the cross obediently and he died. He died a tremendous death. But the Bible also tells us that on the third day, he came back to life defeating death and sin forevermore. And I remember distinctly, October of 1993, understanding this fact that if Jesus indeed defeated death and sin forevermore, that I, I wanted to be on team Jesus because if he can defeat death and sin, then that's the team. I need to be on, and that's the team that I want to be on. And so if you're here today, my friend, don't leave this place without making Jesus the Lord of your life. And it's simple. Romans 10, 9 says that if we simply just confess with our mouth and believe in our heart the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says that you will be saved And here's the amazing thing. Jesus has done all the hard lifting for you already. All you need to do is just receive his gift of salvation. He paid a heavy, heavy price. And so understanding that, you ask Jesus to become the Lord and Savior of your life. And you ask him to transform 
form you through his spirit and through his word. And just like that, today is your day of salvation. It's simple. Your eternity is set. Your life is forever transformed, not only for eternity, but for the here and for the now. So for those of us online and those of us here in person, I'm going to ask everyone to close your eyes. And if you're here and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you've never asked Jesus to save you, don't leave this place. Don't leave this place. And if that's you, I would love for you to make, to say this prayer with me. The prayer doesn't save you. What the prayer does, it explains the decision that you have already made. You put one and two together. And so that's you. If you want Jesus today, say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. And I know that I am a sinner and I'm in dire need of a savior. And today I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that God, you raised Jesus from the dead. Today, right now, I plead with you, save me. And I allow you to sit on the throne of my heart as Lord and Savior. And Savior. Fill me with the Holy Spirit to teach me, to know you, to love you, to serve you, and to tell others about you. And the day that I die, I know that I will be with you forever. Thank you for saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, Church Online. Powerful message there uh, from Pastor Juan as we kicked off this brand new series called Rise Up, uh, looking at the story of Nehemiah. And this is one of my favorite uh, stories of the Bible. I love looking at Nehemiah chapter one as he really just kind of uh, is wondering what the condition of his city is like. And he finds out uh, what it's like, that it's broken, that it's uh, it's greatly troubled, that the walls are broken down, uh, that it, it's it's in a, in, a, in a not so good condition. But His response in that moment is a beautiful response. So we get to just read Nehemiah's prayer. That his response when he finds out about the condition of a city is simply to bow down before God in prayer. Uh, And I don't know about you, but I know for me, one of my first response is going to be to uh, start doing things, start getting stuff done, start rebuilding right away, and to start creating a task list and going after different uh, goals and tasks. But I love that he just pauses for a moment and spends time in prayer. And not just in prayer asking God for stuff. That's that's our normal prayer time, right? If, if we're all willing to admit that, that normally our prayer time looks like simply requesting things from God. God, help me with this. I want to see this happen. But his prayer time is not just re- requesting, but repenting. That he's spending time saying, God, we confess this of our lives over to you, God. And I love that, that his time of prayer begins with repenting before requesting. And I challenge all of us to consider what is our prayer time like? Is it repentance first and then requesting? Uh, And maybe we just need to pause and say, God, this has been the direction of my life and I desire to see you do this, but I am opening up myself to you. and, And even though you already know, I'm admitting that this is where I'm at. Uh, And what we just did a while ago that Pastor Juan just let us out in is really a response of salvation, a a prayer of salvation, of simply recognizing our need for Jesus. And that is a repentance prayer. It's It's a prayer of saying, God, I've been living my life this way without you, and I am ready to accept Jesus and fully follow after him. It's a repentance of saying, I'm done living my life this way, and I want to live my life towards Jesus. And so what I want to do really quick as we consider the first response is allow anybody who maybe prayed that prayer alongside Pastor Juan uh, to let us know who you are. And so if you said yes to Jesus today, you gave your life to Jesus for the very first time, and you prayed that prayer alongside Pastor Juan, then do me a huge favor, grab your phone and text the phrase BT Salvation to 97,000. When you do that, you're going to be given a simple questionnaire to fill out your basic information. Uh, But we want to know who you are because we'd love to know your name. We'd love to pray over you. And we'd love to celebrate with you what we believe is that you made the best decision that you will ever make 
in accepting Jesus because now Jesus is your inheritance, heaven is your inheritance, and you get to walk this life with him. And so if that's you, let us know who you are because we cannot wait to celebrate alongside you. Uh, and for, for so many people tuning in, maybe you already know Jesus, then my uh, really desire for you is to consider the condition of your city, right? Consider your general area, maybe your home life, your city, your community, wherever it is that you're from, and just kind of observe the city, right? What are people putting their hopes and dreams in? What are people finding their identity in? What idols or maybe people are worshiping? And rather than maybe consider like, all right, I'm gonna go do X, Y, Z, consider just praying for people as step one, right? That Let that be your first response of praying over your city. Because I believe this, that the passion to change your city is going to start with prayer. So let's pray over our cities, pray over our areas uh, as we continue to see God work in miraculous ways. And so I hope and pray that you were moved by this message, that you were challenged and encouraged uh, by this message. And let me also remind you of this, is that we are starting a Nehemiah reading challenge that maybe, you know, that's the first time you've been introduced to the story. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks of just reading through the entire book of Nehemiah as we spend the next eight weeks studying the book of Nehemiah during our weekend sermon series. And so if you want to jump in on the Nehemiah reading challenge, just text BT online to 97,000 and follow the steps. This is going to be done through the BT Church app where we can be able to read the daily passage and then interact and chat with each other uh, from that day's reading. And so I'm excited for anybody that will be willing to jump into the Nehemiah Reading Challenge. It might be a chapter a day. It could be a little bit less. Uh, but let's dive into this book and study it as we get ready for what God has for us. And so Church Online, let's close out believing that God's going to do the above and beyond things in your city, in your area, in your homes, and in your life as well. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 goes like this. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Church Online, we love you guys and we'll see you all next time.